Moving on to our <coughs> next item 124, which is to consider a report from the Ordinance Committee regarding leaf burning and take any necessary action. We would have the Chairman of the Ordinance Committee, Nancy Masterton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. A few weeks ago, uh, all members of the Council received a letter from a Cape citizen asking for a ban on leaf burning. At one of our neighborhood meetings a few weeks ago, this same gentleman showed up and uh, repeated the request. So um, <coughs> the Ordinance Committee took the matter under advisement, and at our meeting on March 28, 1989, we reviewed the request to discontinue leaf burning in Cape Elizabeth. Our review included a look at our current burning permit application. Here it is. The white copy is to be retained by the fire chief, and the yellow one goes to the permittee. And this is to be signed by the, by, well, it's the fire chief, who is the town forest fire warden and the director of the main forest service. And we also took a look at the state of Maine rules and guidelines for open burning as issued by the DEP and the Department <coughs> of, Conversation, uh, of Conservation and a review of our current ordinance. This is the state rules and guidelines. Um, the current ordinance, the CAPE ordinance, provides that burning may be done quote, under specific permission from the fire chief, under proper safeguards as he may direct as to time and weather conditions, and on condition that said permittee keep sufficient control of said fire. The state burning permit law provides that A, the existing wind speed, wind direction, and atmospheric conditions must not create any nuisance conditions. B, that burning should ta take place with all necessary precautions to prevent the spread of the fire. And C, supplemental conditions may be added to the permit to further ensure fire safety and air pollution control. The safety guidelines in the state pamphlet, this, suggest certain wind standards and recommends that burning not occur during an inversion or when stagnant air conditions are evident. It is the opinion of the Ordinance Committee that the Fire Chief's right to establish proper safeguards, together with the existing state laws, preclude the need for a new ordinance. We believe that burning should continue, but with greater attention to atmospheric conditions. It is our recommendation to ask the town manager to work with the fire chief to develop revised administrative regulations for the issuance of open burning permits. And I would like to make a motion to that effect. I'll second. It's been moved and seconded. Any further discussion on this recommendation from the Ordinance Committee? which in this very unique case is to do nothing regarding changing our ordinances. Most, most of the time as you watch us we have uh, changes or new ordinances are created and here's a unique situation where we are letting the status quo, other than asking the town manager to continue to work with the fire chief to make sure burning occurs under proper conditions. That's a green line. This was brought to our attention because of a concern about leaf burning. I'm wondering what other kinds of burning we're talking about. Under state law, there is to be no burning at the dump as of January 1, 1989, except for brush and demolition materials. Are we talking about people being able to burn grass in the fields? That is included in this permit. Okay. Um, there are various options, burning slash, grass or pasture, blueberry land, brush, or other. So there are different categories. Okay. One and, uh, and Janet, I'll just continue to say that um, equipment must be on standby, like a hose and, and access to, to water uh, for safety, and there must be adults 
watching the fire sufficient to control it should it spread? Okay, we're talking about the atmospheric conditions. Now, one concern that I have and citizens have discussed with me is when people are burning wet leaves, and that doesn't necessarily fall under atmospheric conditions. And I'm wondering, doesn't seem to me that we have any provisions disallowing or dealing with the wet leaf situation, which is when, in my experience, the smoke can be the worst. And I'm, I'm very concerned about this. I really do not like the fact that we have so much open burning. And I'm not sure that we're sufficiently dealing with it. And another point to buttress that maybe is also the pollution issue, which I think was what the citizens were really talking about. Regardless of the atmospheric conditions, isn't it, aren't we now getting more sophisticated to say that, yes, it's a quaint New England tradition, and yet it is pouring more pollutants into the atmosphere? And I think that this is the problem for those that may have asthma or suffer from emphysema or have lungs far more sensitive than, than those of us up here. It will affect them because we're continuing to pump more pollutants, albeit you know, not, not as, as volatile as, as toxic chemicals or something, but nonetheless pollutants into the atmosphere. So it's another, that's another problem. Comments? Councilor Jordan? Yeah, Mr. Chairman, if, if someone is doing some burning and they're burning them wet leaves and is creating a lot of smoke and not accomplishing anything and they get a complaint from a neighbor, fire chief can revoke that permit and have the fire put out like that. So th there's really no big problem, but if somebody's got a chance to burn something legitimately, they have a right to do it. But if someone's causing a problem, he has a right to go and have that fire put out. I'll put it out themselves. I think that helps to let the citizens know what the mechanism is in case there's something going on in the neighborhood that's really causing disturbances, that you can do that, have that done. Just if I, if I may, one of the <coughs> part of the process, uh, if this is approved tonight, uh, with the fire chief will be reviewing all the different forms and the instructions. Uh, certainly wet leaves uh, do contribute to quote unquote nuisance conditions and uh, that is something that we will address and we will write into uh, the rules and regulations uh, that wet leaves do contribute to nuisance conditions and the, that they're not to be burned. I think we should emphasize that, that the concern here is health and um, not just nuisances but health safety and welfare so that um, I'm sure that the manager and, and the fire chief will address that and you will be reporting back to us in the future when you have drawn up the new guidelines no no I'll be providing you a copy of the administrative regulations but uh, not for uh, acceptance right. but we will see them yes Michael do you know of any other towns in Maine that have banned leaf burning I'm not aware of any, but uh, there may be. Generally, uh, communities that have rubbish pickup do not allow burning. Even leaf burning? I mean, any type Period. of, in other words, they being all burning. All burning. Once in, a, with the, once in a while, they will in relation to construction, that type of thing. But the general burning on the side of the street in communities with trash pickup is a thing of the past. As I understand it, burning on the street is prohibited it in is Cape Elizabeth. There's, there's a number of rules. That is, yeah. that is one of them. We have had discussions a number of times with uh, folks who have chosen to burn on uh, streets. Okay, all the, oh, yes, sorry. Yeah, I just wanted to make a couple of points because, uh, <coughs> you know, as I read over this business, uh, it really sounds like you've got to be a bit of a meteorologist to... Uh, really take uh, consideration of all this uh, wind speed, wind direction, and everything else. I'm not aware that you've got to really uh, read over all this business before you get your permit. You basically go get your permit from the fire chief and you go to it and keep your fingers crossed. Um, I think it's an it's a, uh, extra amount of pollution. And I also think that in general, you know, uh, even if it's a problem, you know, most neighbors aren't going to call the cops and, and the fire department. They're going to tolerate it and just hope that it ends, you know, as soon as possible. Uh, again, keeping one's fingers crossed. And I, I don't know. I think it's a nuisance, and I think it's uh, not healthy. Um, and uh, 
that's where I stand on it. Other comments? Mr. Chairman? Yes. Uh, neighbors do call, and they do call quite often if the smoke is just hanging in there and hanging by the house. And if they see the neighbors got a little bit more than they can handle, they'll call and have somebody come down and check it out. So they do call in if there is a problem. So I wouldn't be concerned about that. And I think this is a, a good way to give it a shot. And if it doesn't work out and there's too many complaints come along, we can review it again and move on. But I think it's workable. Most every community allows it with permit only under certain conditions. The dispatcher who issues a permit up there at the office there, it's a windy day, they don't know the weather forecast, and they feel it's too windy, they don't allow the permit. And they go into the weather conditions and the conditions, but they don't know the, like you say, they're not a real professional meteorologist, but they understand whether they should be, it's too windy or it isn't too windy to burn. And they'll also inform them, they come up at noon time, it's quite windy, they'll tell them, we can't give it now, but come back later on and do it in the evening or something like that. And that's the way a lot of the communities handle it. How long is the permit for? They sign up, it's for a set number of hours. Uh, we, uh, we will be purchasing, if this is approved, a wind speed indicator. Uh, they're about $200 and, you know, it's one of those wind speed and direction. I know Bill has one uh, and they, they are fairly accurate and effective. So uh, the dispatcher will have that available uh, to assist in the meteorolo meteorological task. We'll have to get out the police manual again and re revise the job description. The only other question I have is we, we suddenly uh, made a distinction here between fires, grass fires, and then the, bur the leaf burning kind of, you know, the neighborhood community thing. Are there any reasons why it, someone would have to burn part of their field or that fields are burned regularly around here? Or what, what, are those, what are those reasons? Well, um, fields are burned to improve the grass, the pasture. Uh, the burning lends ash to the ground, which conditions the soil. Isn't that right, Bill? And it makes for greener grass, healthier, more. Mm -hmm. More vitality. Is that being done by a, a number of people in this town regularly anymore? Well, I Michael mean, is shaking his head. Oh. It certainly is done in the country. The t town did it at Fort Williams two or three weeks ago on slopes. When it does, it gets a lot of the tall grass and the growth. And uh, so when that comes up again in the spring, it'll be nice and green. Mr. Chairman? Yes. I also want to add about neighborhoods. I think that if a neighborhood knows that someone in the neighborhood has asthma or emphysema. I do think that neighbors bend over backwards to be cooperative. Mm -hmm. Okay. And before I, I, we leave the subject, I want to ask the manager if he is aware of complaints of any or many complaints about leaf burning. Yes, we do have complaints. Uh, Many? Uh, I, I couldn't quantify them, but uh, you know, I think at times, uh, well, I, I know there was one weekend when last fall when I was down in the, the Oakhurst area, and if people didn't complain, perhaps they should have. Uh, so, you know, even, you know, I, I don't know if it's fair to quantify the complaints and measure, measuring or not whether or not there really is a problem. Uh, you know, and I think that particular day that I saw that it was last fall was wet constantly, the leaves, and it was just not a year to burn leaves. Uh. See how these little subjects folks really keep us going here, don't they? They turn into big, big Leaf oak trees. Burning. <laughs> yes, I, Council Jordan. I would just like to say uh, I agree with the manager and his wind speed machine on the public safety building, but I'll let you know the wind speed up on top of the hill there will be so different than it would be over in Oakhurst. So I <laughs> hope they take that in consideration. Yeah. We, we, we're aware of that problem. Can you? Perhaps the Oakhurst neighborhood would buy their own. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All those in favor of the motion that is before us, which is to uh, accept the recommendation of the Ordinance Committee, please raise your hands. All those opposed? The motion carries four to three.
Okay, moving on to item number 125. The very busy ordinance committee once again is going to be re reporting in the form of Councillor Nancy Masterton on the ambiguity in the sewer <coughs> ordinance and taking any necessary action. Uh, the Ordinance Committee um, attempted on March 28 to deal with um, an, a an ambiguity in the current sewer ordinance, an ambiguity that was brought to our attention a few months back when we heard an appeal <coughs> from Mr. Drynan, who is in this very room tonight, um, to sewer a, poor, uh, a subdivision that he contemplated that was not actually on the sewer, but he wanted an extension. And he came before the council on an appeal. And it was at that point that we realized what the ambiguity in the sewer ordinance was, and we have tried to deal with it. Very briefly, um, under the present sewer ordinance, we have a treatment plant with a limited capacity. It was built that way. And we have allocated um, in several different categories uh, the capacity of that sewer. That is, for residential areas, 162,000 gallons per day. For schools, 40,000 gallons per day. For other public buildings, 2,000 gallons per day. For commercial, including nursing homes and congregate care facilities, 30,000 gallons per day. And for infiltration, which is the groundwater leaking into the, the pipes and having to be treated at the treatment plant, 283,000 gallons per day, which is more than any other category. It's interesting to know. Um, the policy as uh, presented by the Sewer Study Committee way back before, uh, which reported before the second referendum on the sewer facility, which passed, as you will remember. The philosophy behind that report and really behind the referendum was that the sewers not be extended, that excess capacity of the treatment plant be taken up by fill-in development. That is, in areas that are already sewered in the Southern Cape, and for that matter in the Northern Cape, where there are empty lots, um, those lots would, would uh, have sewer in the future and would use up ac excess uh, uh, capacity in the treatment plant. Also, we have numerous people kind of on hold who are not hooked up. They're in the sewered area, but they are not hooked up. They are paying a readiness to serve charge. So they are future eligible participants in the, in the sewer system and treatment plant. On the other hand, and this is all reflected in, in the sewer ordinance, on the other hand, also in the ordinance, is a provision for extension of the sewer system by a petition. Um, now, <coughs> let me read you what, how that goes in the ordinance. In regard any one or more property owners, builders, or developers may propose the extension of any sanitary sewer within the town, leading to a sewage treatment plant by presenting to the town council a petition, therefore, signed by the owners of at least two-thirds of the buildings and properties which would be eligible to connect to such sewer under the provisions of section 15-14. So there is already a process for a petition um, to be connected up to the sewer. The, these are not areas ready to serve or areas in the existing sewered areas. 
the question, the policy question that was posed to the Ordinance Committee um, was should we go, should we endorse the extension idea, which was clearly not part of the referendum question that was posed to, to the people here, or should we have some sort of a, a process to, for petitioning in case of emergencies, a kind of safety valve. What um, the sewer ordinance, uh, what the ordinance committee has come down on with the help of the town attorney is the following. And this is the proposed revised sewer ordinance which we hope to put to public hearing next month. <clears throat> and I, I'm going to read it because there are probably people out there who are interested in this and uh, who might be affected by it. And this is the new language. In regard to proposed residential uses, any one or more owners of lots which, one, <coughs> are presently improved with residential structures thereon, Two, are presently utilizing private subsurface sewage disposal systems for such structures. And three, are not otherwise eligible <coughs> to connect to the public sewer under either section 15-1-4B or C, nor the third subparagraph hereof, may petition the town council to approve an extension of the public sewer so as to make such lots eligible to connect thereto under section 15-1-4 B and C, provided that in addition to compliance with the standards set forth hereafter, the town council shall not approve such extensions unless at least two-thirds of the lots to be made eligible thereby have residential structures thereon utilizing public, a private subsurface sewage system. Such petition must be signed by the owners of at least two-thirds of the buildings and properties which would be eligible to connect to such sewer under the provisions of section 15-1-4. Then we discovered that we had not dealt with non-residential uses. And remember, we have set aside allocated um, 30,000 gallons per day of treatment in the treatment plant in regard to non-residential uses, any one or more owners of lots desiring an extension of the public sewer in order to connect a structure to be used for non-residential use pursuant to 15-1-4D may petition the town council to approve such extension of the public sewer provided that the petition is signed by at least two-thirds of the buildings and properties which would be eligible to connect to such sewer and uh, implied in that message is that if it's only one building which in a business zone, a commercial building, wants to hook up to the sewer, then, you know, that one owner would be equivalent to two-thirds of many. So with that, Mr. Chair uh, Mr. Chairman, I will <coughs> move that we post this proposed uh, amendment to the sewer, sewerage ordinance for May 8th um, regular meeting, 7.30 at the town hall. Hall second. Been moved and seconded to post to a public hearing at that time. And thank you for your explanation. Of a very complex matter that she waded through quite gracefully, I thought. Any, uh, it, we are going to have a public hearing on it. Is there anyone that cares to speak on it at this juncture that's in the public? If not, are there any councilors that would care to make any comment before we vote? Councilor Jordan. Yes, I would just like to make, I have a couple of comments, which you can see in the notes. There was a dissenting vote mm. through the ordinance committee, and I'll come up and say I was a dissenter. And, uh, I'm not so much opposed to cleaning up the language of this, but I think it's a wrong direction for us to be going as far as the sewers go. Here we have a southern Cape sewer, which has 
283,000 gallons just for infiltration and 234,000 of it just for use. Now that's more for infiltration than we have for actually sewer. To me, there's something wrong with our plant and there's some, I don't say the plant, something wrong with our system that I should think that we should have people hook up in this, into the sewer, give the town a few bucks, and do something about our infiltration. <laughs> and that is the direction that I feel we should go. I don't feel that we should continue here and have people build houses and continue to put the sewage into the ground. That's what it was done generations ago, and here we had to come and correct that problem. And I'm not going to sit here and vote to have that to continue for another generation or so to have to come back and correct a problem that we created at our time here. And I think we should take a look at that. I know people say you've got 80,000 square feet, you've got uh, area enough for one or two plant, uh, septic systems, but you're still polluting the ground. We had a development here just a short while ago. Should have been sewer. The pipes would have been put in the ground. He would have done it. And a lot of the systems at this point is higher than the Spermic Marsh. And I think that is one direction to head. And... Uh, I would just like to say we adopted something here a week ago, I mean the last council meeting, where people, if they want to pay their first charge, then they don't have to pay a readiness to see of charge until they decide to hook up. So that fee can go on, they might wait 10 years before they want to hook up, and they don't have to put a penny towards a plant. So the people that's on it are going to have to pay for them until they decide to put their money in, and I don't think that's the right direction to go either and I voted against that process. I am going to have some more figures at the public hearing of just the capacity of the plant, what it's doing today. This is a southern sewer, and to see what can be done to turn this around so we can start putting people on the sewer and not pollute the ground. And I think that we should be headed in that direction, and I'm going to push hard for it if I am reelected this term. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> As you can see, we have a vocal majority and minority <laughs> position on this committee that's coming forward tonight. Are there other comments or questions? Yes, Council Crum. I would just suggest that we perhaps tighten up the, uh, the language here in the proposed uh, new uh, ordinance regarding ambiguities in that um, uh, one to third paragraph down that we insert where it says at least two-thirds of the and I would insert owners of the buildings and properties which would be eligible to connect to mm -hmm. such sewer. Mm -hmm. That's a very good suggestion. My question is, is now a good time to do that or after the public hearing? I would think prior Amend to it now. So you want to amend the motion? Would you make a formal? I'll make a formal motion that we uh, insert my uh, previously read statement, owners of the uh, in between the and buildings. Wayne, you want to amend the motion to post a public hearing, which is on the floor right now. Mm -hmm. You're yes. amending that one. Yes, indeed. Mm -hmm. Post it to public hearing with the following With amendments. the following amendment. And that's been seconded by Council Amber. All those in favor of the amendment to the motion, then, please raise your hand. Passes unanimously 7 to 0. And now, all those in favor of the main motion as amended, please raise your hand. If there's no further discussion, passes unanimously 7 to 0. So, this will be set, this uh, clearing up the ambiguities of the sewer ordinance will be set for May 8th public hearing here at Town Hall 730. We're moving on to item 126, which is to consider approving the warrant for the May municipal election and take any necessary action. And Michael, I'd ask you. The uh, town clerk has prepared the warrant. It's uh, standard. They'll be voting for two members of the town council. The terms of uh, uh, Mrs. Amro and uh, Mr. Jordan are expiring. Uh, there's one uh, position on the school board uh, for the term of uh, Harold Patius is expiring. Uh, the town clerks has proposed here that the Voting take place on uh, June 8th at the, excuse me, on May 2nd 
at the uh, usual location, Cable Elizabeth High School, 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. Also move that we accept the warrant. It has been moved. Second. And seconded to accept the warrant. Any further discussion? If not, all those in favor? Any opposed? Passes unanimously 7 to 0. Item 127 is to con consider endorsing the proposal of the City of South Portland for purchasing land in the Spring Point area under the Land for Maine's Future program and taking any necessary action. What I'd like to do at this juncture is simply to read the resolution, which is fairly self-explanatory, uh, on this matter. And it says, the Cape Elizabeth Town Council, resolution supporting Breakwater Point purchase. Whereas the City of South Portland has submitted an application to the Land for Maine Future Fund for the acquisition of Breakwater Point, and whereas Breakwater Point could serve to both re re relieve and complement Fort Williams Park in Cape Elizabeth, which is amongst the most heavily used municipal parks in the state of Maine, whereas the acquisition of Breakwater Point would assist with water access needs identified by Cape Elizabeth's Harbor Advisory Committee and by South Portland's Spring Point Shoreway Plan, and whereas opportunities like Breakwater Point are being lost due to advancing development, now, therefore, be it resolved that the Cape Elizabeth Town Council does hereby endorse the application of the City of South Portland for the acquisition of Breakwater Point, and we encourage the Land for Maine Futures Board to acquire this important visual, recreational, historical, and irreplaceable resource, dated this 10th day of April, 1989, in Cape Elizabeth, Maine. We also have as backup to our packet, by the way, the City of South Portland, uh, the, the application that they've made, which we've been able to review over the weekend giving some more specifics as to why they're going after this piece of property and why they consider it so valuable and, and their rather strong arguments that they've put forward to the land board. Are there any comments any councils would like to make before voting? I, I have a ask. question. In what way would a South Portland or well, the state acquiring Breakwater Point, we have a map here, uh, which is sort of on the point of South Portland across from, isn't it? Is it where Bug Light is? Mm. Right. Yes. Um, looks right, like. Bug light. In what way would it um, assist with water access needs identified by Cape Elizabeth Harbor Advisory Plan? Yes. Uh, one thing it would do is the. Uh, you know, water access is, is in terms of not only putting boats in the water, but also being on the ocean, uh, you know, physically, you know, people being in a park area along the shore, and that's what's intended uh, by that. As well as, you know, in the boat access question itself, the South Portland <coughs> public boat landing is immediately adjacent to this site, and uh, it will enable the city of South Portland to better uh, plan traffic flow in and around that boat landing right now, the very large parking lot as well as, uh, I think, informing uh, Cape Elizabeth people uh, better. You know, not that the boat owners don't know, but uh, I think they'll become more aware of it. Uh, it'll, it'll just be a, a much better flow down there. So it's quite a sight. I think it's a little far-fetched as a reason. <laughs> but um, I'm glad to support <laughs> South Portland. Maybe we'll send some Cape people over if, if that's a park, a recreational place. And um, maybe maybe South Portland people won't come to mm. our park. Uh, what, what? Maybe we'll have a trade-off. About 30 percent of the users of Fort Williams Park are from the city of South Portland. So you know it's assumed that you know if another access point becomes available on the South Portland shore, that uh, uh, some of their citizens uh, might use that. And I think some of ours would would use it as well. It's a it was with some improvements, it'd be a beautiful, uh, it's a beautiful point of land. Some of our citizens use a boat launch in the room. I move the adoption. Seconded. It's been moved and seconded. I'd like to say that I'm very happy to support this, and I'll be more happy when South Portland Council can have a resolution similar to this supporting a land acquisition attempt by us in terms of this, the town of South Portland. And this is something that I've continued to try to harp at I'm happy to support them in any way because I think this is an excellent thing for anything in our area, but I'm still at a loss for exactly who is determining within our town what potential sites should come before the main lands board. And I know that every, you know, nothing is a sure thing, but neither is everything hopeless. 
And these people are putting in with every high hope that they can get it. Certainly, given that 75% of our town is undeveloped, some of our lands must be applicable to be brought before this board. Is there anyone who's specifically charged with reviewing the lands and then making an application and presentation? The town council requested information on the land for Maine Futures program. I uh, asked a number of questions uh, on whether or not the land would be state controlled, privately controlled. Uh, all that information was provided to the town council. Uh, it was the conservation commission as well aware of it as well. If any of those groups, any of you as individuals, want to recommend a specific uh, location, uh, you know, I'd be happy to uh, work with the town council and the various bodies to uh, prepare an application. But as of this yet, as of this time, even having distributed all the material, uh, I have not heard a, a single suggestion uh, from anyone of a piece of land they would like to see Cape Elizabeth uh, enter into this program and to have state controlled. So the proper thing would be for those citizens, perhaps like myself, that are interested, to go out and actually you know, survey, look it over, and then work through you as the manager in preparing an application if we felt one was applicable. If, if any counselor brought a suggestion bef before to me, or any board, I would run it by the rest of the council just as, as we do any other proposal uh, coming before the community. Let the word go out far and wide <laughs> to look. Yes. I believe you read the Sunday paper, the, the parcels that, were, that have been proposed by the state. Uh, people have put in uh, bids for mm. state to uh, acquire. But uh, I would have to know what the ifs and ands and buts in the fine lines before I get too far involved in it. What you're going to be able to do with it, because I know one or two of the parcels that are involved there, whether they pick them up or not, I don't know, but. Did we ever get a, a copy in any of our packets of the ifs, ands, and buts, sir? Yes. What? Yes. <coughs> Councilor Amor? Yeah, I remember that we did have quite a discussion, and at the time we felt that with two state parks already in our community, we didn't feel that we were ready to uh, make any proposals that would put more of our land under state control at this time. So that, I think that's why it wasn't pursued any further by the council anyway. And um, I'm still very concerned about that. I, I think we've made quite a contribution with the two state parks that we already have. And uh, I'm very happy to support South Portland's effort to help relieve some of the congestion that we're already feeling. Uh, out here uh, in the facilities that we have, the public facilities. But I, but I think we are all in agreement that maybe some choice pieces of land like are going through these other hundreds of parcels we'd rather see in state's hands maybe than developers' hands or private hands. So I think this is the kind of scenario behind this idea. Does there have to be some sort of interest expressed by the property owner themselves in having a proposal sent to the state? Not when the initial application uh, is suggested. However, when the uh, state goes through the, the point system of uh, awarding points to certain projects, uh, that does become a factor. In, in fact, uh, you know, we did have some discussions with uh, Herb Hartman, the, the head of the Bureau of Parks and Recreation, uh, regarding uh, a couple of sites in Cape Elizabeth, and that very issue came up. Uh, there's one that you know, I'd be happy to mention publicly, and that is the fact that part of Crescent Beach State Park is in fact privately owned, and it, it, is, uh, it is only leased to the state, and uh, that lease will run out uh, at some point in the future. And uh, Herb Hartman, the director of the Bureau of Parks and Recreation, said that he had some more pressing concerns in Scarborough with, uh, with Scarborough Beach, and that they even owned less there, and uh, he, he just felt that the Crescent Beach situation uh, would have to delay a little bit that he felt uh, his priorities were, <coughs> were much stronger in Scotland. Uh, that was another thing that was hurting us in that cause if we wanted to bring that particular proposal forward. There has been a motion. Is that correct? Uh, any, any further discussion? If not, all those uh, in favor of the motion to support the resolution? Any opposed? If not, it <coughs> passes unanimously 7 to 0. Okay, we are moving to item 128, which is to consider proposed operating guidelines for CETV for our cable television station, channel 38, and take any necessary action. I see in the audience past chairman of the committee, Randall Weil. Um, 
there, there is quite an extensive operating guidelines that we've been presented with in our packet. I just want people here and at home to realize quite extensive in their scope, something that the council has been asking for. So as we begin to define further and further some of the operating guidelines in terms of what can go out over the air and those that wish to put something out over the air, how do we, how do, we do so, et cetera. So, Randall, would you like to come up and give an overview? If not, come up anyway, <laughs> give an overview. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I hadn't uh, planned a dog and pony show of any kind, uh, so I'll extemporize. Uh, as you've already said, the operating guidelines were put together by the committee with a view to give the uh, people at the station the uh, ground rules under which they are uh, expected to operate. And I think this will make their job much easier and will enable also people who are interested in making use of the facilities uh, uh, give them an idea of what uh, they can expect and what kinds of uh, opportunities <coughs> may exist. Uh, included are the types of programming that are included, the uh, priority for various types of programming, uh, the rules for using the equipment that the town has at this point and uh, under certain circumstances will make available for, uh, uh, for qualified persons. Um, I, I think these uh, are a good start. They give the uh, coordinator and her staff the uh, ability to make decisions that uh, on a day-to-day -day basis that they've otherwise had to make uh, through some consultation with the committee and the town manager. Mm -hmm. uh, if there are, are there any questions that I might be able to uh, respond to, if there are, I'd be happy to uh, take a shot at it. Any questions for Randall? I have no questions. I think it's a very good job. Only one thing in the minutes, they spoke of a budget in 1890, and I think we'll be on that day. <laughs> <laughs> very good. <laughs> I, I have a question. Now, it might be directed to the town manager. Is, what it, is there a, a motion that's been passed or some type of a policy determined such that it states that certain events that happen within the town government will be broadcast as opposed to optionally may be broadcast. What, what do we need to do in order to say, for instance, let's just say the town council, any town council meeting, regularly scheduled town me council meeting shall be broadcast. In other words, we could not have a four to three vote at a workshop to decide that the next meeting will not be broadcast. Is what, that's, that's kind of the example that I'm using. <coughs> and what I'm can't vote at a workshop. <laughs> right. Okay. Well, we couldn't vote to at a meeting to not televise our next meeting. And I want to know what uh, we're going to be having. What is in place? I don't imagine by us adopting this, this is going to, that that addresses that issue, does it? Um, no. Uh, the plan, I think, uh, with respect to how these uh, meetings are broadcast, is uh, is done through the uh, budgeting process. In that, in order to ensure that meetings, on the assumption that the town council wants certain types of meetings uh, made publicly available. We have included in the budget a certain amount of money to ensure that personnel would be present to operate the equipment. Uh, there are obviously budget, budget limitations, so currently we focus on school board, planning board, and town council meetings. And this year we have submitted some uh, requests for additional funds to broadcast other meetings, uh, maybe not every <coughs> meeting, but uh, those that might be, might be of uh, special concern to the citizens. Mm -hmm. yeah. Michael, what would be the proper mechanism <coughs> to, to try to achieve what I'm talking about? Well, I, I think beyond that, there was, a, there was a state Supreme Court decision about a year or so ago. You recall a gentleman went to a meeting, it was in Dayton, uh, Lyman, Lymington, one of those communities, and was tape recording a meeting. And the decision of the court was that uh, tapes are permitted and uh, the broadcast media can certainly tape a meeting. Uh, you know, if, if uh, the cable folks wanted to uh, tape a meeting of a Board of Assessment Review or whatever, uh, they're perfectly entitled to do that. Uh, every single meeting is available for taping. Uh, the, the council makes the budget decision of whether or not you will actually uh, pay for our municipal funds, uh, you know, for certain programming. And during your budget process, uh, there's quite a bit of money uh, I think it's actually for 100 evenings of programming is in your proposed budget. So it, it gives uh, tremendous uh, ability to uh, expand. Did I answer your question? Uh, rather vaguely, I think. But we, I guess that we have the power, if we wish to not televise ourselves, to not televise ourselves. That's the bottom line, isn't it? There's not, no, there's I, no, think, no. I think, no. Mr. Chairman, what Michael is saying, that once you have a setup, it, the, the public uh, television itself has the right to 
under the right to know law, I guess, mm -hmm. to televise any meeting that they choose to, given within budget constraints. Yeah. You, you have the power not to pay them to broadcast it, because you know, now the, the volunteers do receive a, a small stipend. But if, if they want to broadcast any meeting uh, under that state Supreme Court decision, uh, as Mrs. Mashton said, along with the right to know law, uh, they can do that. Okay. That helps clarify that. Council Greenman? Michael, have we run these by our town attorney, these operating guidelines? Uh, he has He has revealed them. Uh, you know, he is not a, uh, that's not his area of expertise uh, within the law. Uh, he, he hasn't expressed any concerns regarding them, uh, but, uh, you know, he has revealed them. Mm -hmm. But that's, he's not a communications uh, attorney. Other comments or questions? Because I would like to publicly thank all the people that work at Channel 38 and, and Randall for your work and your committee's work. This is outstanding as a, as a good beginning point for us in terms of the operating guidelines, really codify, bring things together. If I could add, we have taken the, uh, the t message of the town council to begin focusing on programming back to the committee and uh, that's our next area of interest. 24 hours a day. If ESPN <laughs> can do it, we can do it. <laughs> okay. Thanks again, Randall. Thank you very much. Okay. Do I have a motion? Mr. Chairman, yes. if we need more money to, to have 24 hours of televised activities a day, mm -hmm. we might consider having a fundraiser for our channel, Excellent. like public Excellent. TV yeah. and radio. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, maybe a, maybe a marathon dance marathon. See who lasts the longest on the dance floor. Oh, a marathon mm -hmm. meeting might be more appropriate. <laughs> I'd be <know> that. <laughs> I would hope Our if you got the 24 hours a day that you would just do the council meetings once and not a couple of times. <laughs> okay. I'm sorry I ever brought it up, and believe me, we're nowhere near going 24 hours a day. Okay. Oh, uh, would someone care to make a motion to accept the... I'll, I'll move that we accept the guidelines as proposed by the... CETV committee. Second. It's been moved and seconded to adopt the guidelines. All those in favor? Excuse me, it's oh. moved to accept. Accept, re acknowledge receipt? Well, you said adopt. I wanted to. Well, I think adopt. we are adopting. Did you say adopt? Yeah. Okay, I did not hear that. Excuse me. Okay. Accept and adopt. We are adopting. Yeah. We have adopted. We're adopting them. <laughs> we're not just acknowledging receipt. We are, we're actually putting them into policy. All those in favor? Any opposed? Okay, we're moving on to item 129, to consider the report of the Visual Access Working Group and take any necessary action. And Michael is going to give us a report about the Visual Access Res Resource Group. Uh, every report in Cape Elizabeth seems to have a certain uh, beginning. Uh, this particular one uh, came out of uh, concern expressed down at the two lights area when uh, a home was to be built there as well as an, an ordinance provision that provides uh, within our subdivision ordinance that we shall protect scenic areas without having any standards and furthermore the harbor advisory committee was asked to look at this and didn't feel too comfortable doing it uh, because they were so busy uh, working on harbor issues and I think you know as you've seen early tonight and have seen uh, on other evenings uh, they, they really had quite a task at hand dealing with those uh, so as, as a result of uh, all those uh, beginnings, uh, we did convene a uh, visual access working group. Uh, it consisted of Alice and Peter Rand, uh, the then chairman of the planning board and the uh, conservation commission, uh, Bill Jordan, Councilor Bill Jordan, representing the Harbor Advisory Committee, uh, Dr. Bob Agan from the Board of Historic Preservation Advisors, Steve Butler, the town planner, and myself. We were assisted by uh, Holly Dominey, uh, who was one of the, uh, who was the state's foremost uh, visual access expert, as well as by Michelle Ringrose. Uh, I think the, the product of the working group's uh, study or work is uh, a, a very uh, fascinating report. I think one that, uh, you know, if, if we're truly interested in protecting visual resources, the, the recommendations in this report uh, give the tools uh, to, uh, to carry out uh, the protection standards. Uh, I could go into quite a bit of detail on it. The hour is getting late. Uh, what I would suggest uh, is that you uh, schedule this uh, for a future workshop uh, at which you can review it more in detail. But it's, it's, a, it's a report that uh, 
I particularly am very proud of and uh, very pleased with the, uh, with the involvement of, of uh, all of the folks who helped out, both the volunteers uh, within the community as well as uh, the consultants. Uh, it's, uh, you know, I think, uh, again, another example of the, uh, the excellent planning that this community uh, does and uh, the excellent level of volunteer participation. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Are there comments on this? Uh, yes, Councilor Cogson. It is a remarkable document, and its main strength is that it has criteria for rating the different areas in town. And although I voted for the Greenbelt plan, I felt that was its primary weakness, that things weren't really prioritized as well as they should be in the actual report, although the wording of our adoption does set priorities. And I would like to see um, areas of the green belt, which I think are already included in this, but more specifically listed according to their, their value incorporated in the green belt report as it now has been accepted. Mm -hmm. Yes, Councilor Jordan. Mr. Chairman, just a couple of comments. I know I didn't staple it together, but I worked on the committee a little bit. <laughs> on page nine, if you read the bottom of page nine, I think page 10 is out of place in my opinion because the end of the sentence of 9, then you should go to page 11 the way this is put together. If, am I right or am I wrong? You are correct. Thank you. Yeah, we, you know, I think this is, this is a report too that will be very much in demand uh, from other communities. I, I think it uh, is one of the first reports of this type that's been done anywhere in the state. And, for that one reason, we do plan to have it bound, uh, spiral. Uh, and to continue along, Mr. Chairman, to let you know that I kind of looked it over, it has Fort, on page 12, it has Fort Williams and HHH, and it's got S, which stands for state owned, and I think that should have a T there. I thought it was Fort Williams or town owned. Oh, yeah. The second yes. Fort Williams down. Right. Is that oh, correct? Should be T, yes. Oh, way down the bottom, CA1? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. State hasn't got their hands on that yet. Uh, <coughs> I hope not. On page 24. You served on this committee, didn't you, Billy? I can tell. <laughs> uh, on page 24, recommendations 1A. I don't think Spike Myers bought us a Wells Road. Not specifically, but it was, it was meant to in, infer that general area. Well, then, then you better include the poor farm and cheese property and the Spring Church as they come around, because they all come down there if you want to do Wells Road. This recommendation is, is, takes in all of those. It's intended no, it, to. It doesn't. It says Sawyer Road, Spring Avenue, and Route 77. And part of those are on the other part of Spunk Avenue, so I wouldn't include them the way I look at the Spunk Marsh, that the Spunk Marsh is bordered by the Spunk Avenue down by the treatment plant, Sawyer Road over by Scarborough Cape Elizabeth Line, and uh, I don't think the other roads include it. I really don't. Yeah, what, what this is intended to take in is as you drive around the marsh, uh, say you come out the refuse disposal or you, you drive up to the church, you go across the bridge into Scarborough, you come back down Sawyer Road, over Wells, and then back up Spurring. If you do that whole circle, it's intended to take everything uh, within that circle with the one exception of any land that uh, is outside the community. I'm not going to win on that one, huh? <laughs> <laughs> well, yes. I know you like things clear, Bill. I don't think that's very clear. But we'll wait to a later date and work on it some more at our workshop. Mm -hmm. Council Coach. When will we be receiving page 19 that's not, that's missing, that particular map? Do you know if it's been printed? I don't know. Uh, <laughs> Sorry. Supposedly, it was in the mail two and a half weeks ago, and <laughs> it is somewhere between here and Manchester, Maine. I'm okay. not sure where it is, and I'm but it, you'll be getting it soon. On um, exhibit number seven, high and medium priority scenic areas, I'm glad to see Richmond's Island finally included 
it seems to have been left off the Greenbelt area. And I think that should be a high priority for the town, as well as the state, to keep in its natural state. I think one thing interesting when they utilize the methodology here is that the Thomas Jordan poor farm property overlooking the mark came out number one. So it, it, this report really uh, is a good fit with the report of the Thomas Jordan Trust Study Committee. Just to give you at home an idea of some of the criteria for rating scenic qualities of special views from roads, the seven criteria listed here are view duration, position of observer, viewing distance, presence of water, degree of naturalism or pastoralism, land use, edge and diversity, and special features. I mean, we, one, one of the real problems was, as we began this, was saying, how can you possibly rate the different views in town? And, and to see this document as to a methodology of how we actually have come to rate different visual resources is, is really an amazing, and I'm sure, as Michael's saying, quite a trend-setting document, I'm very much on the cutting edge. So, Plus, I noticed that most, more of our reports now are having nice pictures attached to them. They're more fun to, to get, Michael. I like that. <laughs> nice <laughs> touch. This report even had page numbers. <laughs> <laughs> Something even our budget had, which put us all into a state of shock. I wonder why the pages were numbered. I would just like to say, in answer to uh, Council Cargoshill, that Richmond Island Seal Coal was my number one. But I don't know how the Jordan Trust and the Poor Farm got ahead of it. But I view that every day, and I don't view Richmond Island every day. Maybe that's why. I, <laughs> I think Seal Cove and Richmond Island is, to me, number one in the best view around. True. Would someone like to acknowledge the receipt of this report? I would move that the council acknowledge receipt of this delightful uh, report. Second. Second. Okay. All those in favor of acknowledging these, this visually <laughs> excitable report? Any opposed? Passes seven to zero. <clears throat> Item number 130 is to consider a report from the Appointments Committee regarding vacancies on the Main Street 90 Committee and taking any necessary action. And I would turn it over to the Chairman of the Appointments Committee, Councilor Amaro. At our March meeting, the Council uh, established a Main Street 90 Committee in response to Governor McKernan's effort for all communities in the year 1990 to come up with some project uh, which celebrates pride in their community. Uh, and as a result of that, uh, the, uh, the Council voted to establish a committee of from 12 to 15 people to uh, come up with a project. Uh, for our participation in, in this Main Street 90. And uh, we are pleased to present to you a committee tonight of 14 people who have happily agreed to serve and are really excited about it. Uh, Dick Tinsman has agreed to chair the committee. Other committee members will be Henry Adams, Judy Dooley, George Dunn, Joe Foley, Bob Hannigan, Priscilla Hare, Audrey Jordan, Richard O'Donnell, Richard Page, Susan Rouser, Barbara Sanborn, E.J. Silk, and Nancy White. And uh, with that, I would like to move uh, acceptance of uh, the Appointments Committee recommendation for Main Street 9. Second. It's been moved and seconded to uh, adopt this, the, the people that would have just been mentioned by Councilor Amro, which is quite a lineup, I must say. Very, it's going to be a super It's, it's committee. going to be a great committee. Some ex exciting things are going to come out of this committee. I'm glad I've, I've supported this from the very beginning, <laughs> as Councilor Amro knows. Okay, I, uh, yes. Are we giving them any sort of a, a mandate? Um, we did for we, uh, last month when, when we established the committee. A specific date for ending, is that right? Well, no. For their proposal? Any time in 1990, we can do it. The, it's up to them to decide. Decide the project. And when. <coughs> and when it will be, be held. Perhaps maybe more than one project. Even. Right. Councilor Masterton. I was not here last month, Jane, and I just wondered how you went about recruiting this committee. We, the usual uh, way, did you we advertise? Ad we advertised, and uh, we made several phone calls also. Did you get a good response with the advertising? Everybody who uh, asked to serve and everyone who we asked to serve said yes, except for one person who was overextended. So we had an excellent response. Good. Very good. Looks like a real dynamite committee. Mm -hmm. I'd say it's a blue ribbon panel. <laughs> Do we have the motion? 
All those in favor of the motion by the Appointments Committee? Any opposed? Passes unanimously. And best of luck with this, with the work ahead. Our next three items, which are, by the way, the last three items of the evening, <coughs> uh, all refer to the Finance Committee and uh, referrals that we'll be making sitting as a town council to the Finance Committee. But before we go through the specifics of those three items, I'd like to have our town manager give some introductory comments regarding the upcoming budget. Michael? Good luck. <laughs> Uh, the, seriously, uh, I, think, I think the budget this year is going to be a particular challenge. Uh, you received tonight uh, the school department budget as well, uh, was, was on the podium here. Uh, the municipal budget itself for the, for the general municipal services as well as the county uh, budget uh, requires uh, a municipal side tax rate of about $3.81. That's an increase of $0.26 cents, uh, in the tax rate or about 7.3%. Uh, the school has uh, divided their budget uh, into two sections. Uh, one is the operate, what they refer to as the operating budget, and uh, that requ would require a, uh, an increase of 70 cents uh, on the tax rate. They have also set aside uh, $1.3 million in capital projects, uh, and they're recommending that those capital projects be bonded uh, over the next 10 years. Uh, in the first year, those would add 30 cents to the tax rate, and would continue then to be approximately a level 30 cents, uh, give or take a few pennies uh, over the life of the, of the bond. Uh, taken together, those add up to a dollar uh, or a 10 or a 10.1 percent increase in the school tax rate. In addition, the community services uh, program that you heard an excellent report on early this evening is uh, requesting an extra penny uh, from the tax rate, which is a 6.6 percent increase, bringing the as I think it's from 15 cents to 16 cents. Uh, adding them all together, it adds up to $1.27. Uh, that is a 9.35 percent increase uh, in the tax rate, which would uh, add up to a total tax rate of $14.85. Uh, the average taxpayer in Cape Elizabeth has a home currently valued by the town at $150,000. Uh, they would pay an annual tax bill of $2,227.50 or uh, $190.50 more than last year. Uh, the total amount raised through taxation, I couldn't believe this when I added it up, was $8.3 million, uh, a, a very considerable uh, sum. The municipal budget itself was greatly affected by a number of factors, and I'd say chief among them uh, are an increase in the county tax, uh, and an, an increase in health insurance, and also uh, the requirement for us to begin to pay a, a road bond issue. Uh, those three items alone uh, account for 36 cents on the tax rate, or uh, when, when you consider that the municipal side tax increase is only 26 cents, you can see that other things had to give in order to, uh, to help fund those. Uh, you know, I do think uh, you know, the budget process will be interesting. You'll be meeting, uh, assuming you refer this to the Finance Committee, uh, you'll be meeting for the first time on Thursday evening to begin uh, reviewing it at a workshop downstairs. and. Uh, uh, I look forward to working with you on it. Uh, I realize the, the increase is more than we would all like it to be. Uh, we have recognized for a long time that this was going to be a difficult year. We, we do do a, a budget uh, impact schedule every single year, and even from five years ago, we knew that the fiscal year 1990 budget was going to be a tough one. Uh, it, it is difficult, and uh, you know I realize that we will have uh, uh, some disagreements amongst ourselves, but. Uh, you know, I think, uh, as in the past, we will uh, disagree agreeably, and uh, I'll uh, move forward when the process is over. So, thank you. Other than your initial statement, thank <laughs> you, too. <laughs> Are there any other comments people would like to make regarding Michael's comments? If not, when the going gets tough, the tough get going. That's why we have Councilor Jordan as our finance chair this year, ready to handle these problems. Thank you, and I think it'll be a challenge, as the manager says. And I know I have won a work very hard in reducing what the manager has proposed, because I don't want to stir people up with a tax cap deal in Cape Elizabeth, I think, where <coughs> can handle the services and just be careful we don't go overboard with them. 
I have some ideas as far. I haven't looked at the school one, but I had some ideas of what the school department's proposing, and I'm a little upset mm -hmm. right at this point. And uh, Thursday night's a start, and I'm raring to go. Good. Good. Would someone care to move item 131, which uh, is to consider referring to the Finance Committee the proposed fiscal year 1990 municipal budget to take any necessary action? Mr. Chairman? Yes. Um, I make the motion to refer to the Finance Committee the proposed fiscal year 1990 municipal budget and take any necessary action. Second. Been moved and seconded. All those in favor? Any opposed? Item 132 is to consider referring to the Finance Committee the proposed fiscal year 1990 sewer fund budget and take any necessary action. So okay. move. Second. Been moved and seconded. All those in favor? Any opposed? Item 133, to consider referring to the Finance Committee the proposed fiscal year 1990 Riverside Cemetery Fund budget and take any necessary action. So moved. Second. Moved and seconded. All those in favor? Any opposed? That brings us to the end of our regularly scheduled items. We now come around once again to citizens' discussion of items not on the agenda. It's time for you citizens to please line up very courteously and don't get in the way of each other. If you'd care to come forward and make any comments. I see a citizen coming forward. <laughs> Would you care to identify yourself, sir, before you? Mr. Capano. Glad, gladly. I met Capano. I live on <coughs> Spelling Avenue. Uh, <coughs> I have two items uh, that I would just take a few moments of your time. Um, I'm greatly concerned uh, about the infiltration into the sewerage system. I'm, I'm really surprised because uh, if my memory says me right about eight years or nine years ago, we did a survey of the system with the idea in mind that we would plug or at least remedy the situation of infiltration into the sewerage system that we had previously. And to uh, I, I, to to feel, to allow two hundred and eighty odd thousand cubic gallons. gallons into a system that is primarily infiltration, that to me is uh, unconscionable. I, I think something's got to be done somehow, somewhere along the line to repair that. If growth continues in Cape Elizabeth. That's a real negative for us because, as Nancy pointed out, uh, people are not going to be allowed to come in on the system unless we enlarge the system. And I expect that in time we probably will have to enlarge it just to take the basic population. So if we can do something about that, uh, I think that would be a plus on our side. And my other comment is uh, in regards to my pet peeve at the transfer station. Last fall or maybe sometime last spring, I did mention the what I felt was a hazard in coming out of the transfer station area and I noticed we did do some work we we had uh, a little blasting done and then to my amazement sometime in the fall we uh, I noticed we heaped the bank up with I don't know whether it's that we picked up from the highway or whatever it was but it just, it just didn't make sense to cut that and then fill it in. Actually, the cut is not sufficient anyway that we made. The cut should go back at least, I would almost say that cut should have been 25 feet in. It should have gone almost to the gate. And that would have given you a site down the road that would almost be to the treatment plant. You still I have to be cautious when you go out that exit or entrance. 
simply because your view is blocked. And if people are coming up Spearwink Avenue at a reasonable clip, which many of them do, and I'm very pleased that we had the, uh, the road got posted 35. But uh, <clears throat> whatever the case may be, people do make a sharp turn coming into the transfer station. So I would like to think that in some time, sometime in the future, we will see that cut back and improved considerably the sight line uh, <clears throat> from the gate. Actually, if you, if you go to the transfer station yourself, stop, look down to the first telephone pole. And if you draw a line from the key post to open the gate down to the pole, first utility pole, you can see where a line should be in regards to the cut in that bank. It'll take you, it'll give you an open view that is uh, just about perfect because that post is somehow in a situation that indicates the cut would go right down through. People will see you coming out and you'll see people coming up. And I would like to think that in time that would be done. It's, it's <coughs> really, a, it really could be, so far we've been fortunate. Although I almost scraped someone's fender the other day simply because they cut very sharply in. Actually, it came in on the right side as I was going out. So it's just one of those situations. So if we can do that, I think we will improve the situation no end. And if you wish, uh, you can uh, think, uh, go get outlandish if you want. I can see shrubs planted there, uh, some uh, form of vegetation uh, for the um, either permanent or just for the summer. It, it, it lends itself to almost anything your mind can create. So with that in mind, I'll leave you and thank you thank, very much. Thank you. Thank you. Michael, are, do you, are there plans to cut that back further? Or? We, well, we did some, I guess, though. Right? We did, and we, we temporarily put some sand sweepings there which don't look so hot. And as soon as the weather's better, we're going to try to clean it up a little bit more. Uh, I think, you know, the other thing in relation to that that Mr. Capano brought up was uh, the fact that people are cutting in a lot closer and that is, is something we have observed that people with the improved sight distance feel a little overly comfortable with it at this point and is that they take a left hand turn going into the refuse disposal area coming up spurling oftentimes they're cutting very very close to folks front fenders and you know I think if, if we ever did uh, improve the sight distance even more there we, we might want to be looking at a traffic island in, uh, or, or, or some, something in order to uh, keep the car, cars in the front lanes. I'm not recommending you do that now, but uh, I think that, that will be a, a, a trade-off if we uh, open up any, any more, because it is getting uh, uncomfortable there with the cars cutting in now. Okay. We'll continue to monitor the situation. That sounds like a cliche, but I, I do mean that I, seriously. I thought it was improved 100% the way it was, and I thought the stuff that you put on there that I didn't know what he was going to try to grow, but uh, <laughs> I thought he was going to plant something there, yeah. some grass or something like that. <laughs> and that was the idea of it, to cover up the rocks and whatever. But I don't know. I'm, I don't want to disagree with Ed Capano or what have you, but because I want him to wave to me next time he goes by. But I think if we clear up too much, we'd have to go like the man just says, you're going to need an island there because I know what happens. People come up there and and uh, they really cut it short, and they cut it shorter now than they used to before it was cut off there. And I don't know, but maybe we better monitor it, and maybe we'll have to put a red light up there. I don't know. <laughs> I should have mentioned there were no red lights in the budget. <laughs> any other citizens' discussion of items not on the agenda? If not, are there any miscellaneous uh, items we'd like to take up before we entertain a motion to adjourn? I'd like to just remind everybody the first finance committee meeting is Thursday at 7.30 p.m. here at Town Hall. And we have our new schedule, which the, which the manager has sent us so that we're all working off of the same script. 
Also, I wanted to publicly thank Councillor Greenlaw for her work on my behalf uh, for, for greeting the delegation from the Soviet Union and for all the courtesies that you councillors extended to, to it sounded like a, an outstanding affair there at the Inn by the Sea. So my kudos for your international diplomacy. Uh, any other one th one thing comments? I, uh, the manager and I were supposed to, and we did, attend a meeting with the fire service of different communities, and I see that as it was in the minutes here, and I didn't report on it earlier, but uh, we did attend, and it was down here in the supper room, and there was a good number of communities from Cumberland County, the local ones more. They all have the same problem as far as volunteers as <coughs> Cape Elizabeth does, and they've tried different things, and trying to get away from hiring permanent men. But uh, I think we come up with some ideas, and I don't know whether they're going to get tried or not, but it basically was that you got to come up with some kind of an incentive for people today to want to join a fire department and, and drop their meat and potatoes when they're halfway through and go to a fire or something like that. They don't do that like they used to years ago. So different ones went left with different ideas, and I don't know whether it'll, anything will come out of it or not. But the managers, I believe, was going to discuss it at a manager's meeting. Am I correct, sir? And uh, maybe something can be done here. Just one other might make mention. Uh, in the notes, uh, one of the odds and ends memos, there was an indication of the boundary hearing coming up at the town of Skyber. That has been changed. It's now scheduled for the uh, Friday the 21st. I think it's 9 a.m. I spoke to Eleanor Redmond today. <coughs> she and her family are the, the primary affected property owner, and she plans to attend the hearing, and uh, we may go up together. Uh, it's that same, the state and local government committee, the same day is hearing a bill and setting up a, a state commission to look at the fire uh, personnel problems. Remember they mentioned that at the, the meeting bill. So might stay for that as well, but it looks like it could be a, a long day. I'm not too sure, Eleanor, if I go with her, will want to stay uh, that long, but uh, uh, perhaps they will take it early because I'm sure there will be other people there for them. Mike asked them to take it out of order. Sometimes they'll do that if it's at the end of the as list. Long as, as long as they don't take it before the Cape Scarborough boundary bill. I think we're second on a, on a very long, the, the notice of the, meeting was like four inches, five inches long, just for that one committee alone with hearings that day, taking up a lot of bills. There's another one there for another community to change the boundaries. Mm -hmm. I also wanted to thank uh, the manager for the information you provided us in our packet regarding professional development and evaluation of the staff. It was quite extensive, and, and we had mentioned that we were looking forward to, to seeing this. And it's good to see that our staff is involved in a number of ways here in Cape Elizabeth, and citizens should be pleased to know in growing in their profession as well, not just doing their job day in and day out, but, but looking for ways. And Michael has been encouraging the staff to look for ways to grow. And we have been given extensive information in packet about it, and kudos to you on, on that as well. If, is this getting too syrupy? Maybe we should just have a yes. motion to adjourn. So, so moved. Been moved, moved and seconded. All those in favor of the motion to adjourn passes unanimously. We stand adjourned. Thank you. That meeting, as far as the folks <laughs> might be interesting.